Hey there, and welcome to Becoming a Bowhunter. I'm your host, Matty, and join me and our guests as we take the quality of meat back into our own hands. Searching the wild for free-ranged animals to harvest as ethically as we can. I interview a variety of specialists from the bow hunting community to help fast track your journey as a bow hunter. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this chinwag on one of your favorite topics in the world, bow hunting. What's up, my bow hunting friends? Um, welcome back to another episode. Pretty pumped to share this one with you. It's with Al Kidner. Um, and if you've been involved, well, I guess if you've been around the scenes for a while, you probably have seen his name pop up quite a lot. Um, and this is a pretty cool one because we get talking about traditional bow hunting quite a lot. Um, Al uses a, a range of different bows as we talk about throughout the podcast um, and to be honest it actually got me to get my recurve back out after talking to Al so thank you for that Al but um, yeah I think it was really cool. Before we do get into the podcast I want to do a few little shout outs um, a few people that have got their first chittle deer down just over this last week which I think is an absolutely amazing um an amazing journey and anyone who's ever obviously ever chased chittle knows how hard that can be um so reed hall who actually lent me his um his cut evolution the the release aid if you remember back to if you've listened to those episodes back a while ago he lent me his release aid to send it to me and just said mate have a good play with it let me know what you think send it back when you when you're free uh or when once you kind of finish with it and um yeah i thought that was just absolutely amazing so reed well done on getting your first um Chittle deer down, dude. That's absolutely incredible. Chittle stag, it's pretty amazing. Um, as did M. Corbett. She, previous guest, she got her deer down just recently. Um, it must have been a week or so ago, um, which I think is just absolutely incredible as well. She's been working so hard for that, and I've actually asked M to come back on the podcast, so we're going to do a little talk hopefully in a few weeks' time. <laughs> Lastly, uh, Sean. Now, Sean owns uh, Dog and Gun Coffee. He's the man behind the, the beautiful coffee there. Um, <laughs> But he actually has had chittle deer down before. He's he's actually one of the most re- relentless, like ongoing, hard driven guys that I see in the bush. Like he gets out there all the time um, and works his ass off. And so that was just a very rewarding stag. I I think <laughs> I didn't even uh, like for me it was a rewarding stag. So I can't imagine what he feels like. <laughs> um, so to those three, well done. You guys are incredible. Um, it's very inspirational to watch it all kind of unfold. So. Um, with that being said, though, I would like to introduce you to the podcast. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode with Al Kidner. Good stuff. Well, guys, welcome back to Becoming a Bow Hunter. I'm excited. Al, I've actually had a fair few people reaching out to me asking for you to come onto the podcast. It's interesting. I just dropped an episode this week on the 2022 bows. Um, and a traditional bow hunter is like, Maddie. I've been listening to your podcast for a long time and you've, you've done some traditional work, but not enough. So when are you going to get someone like Al Kidner on to talk about trad bows? So <laughs> <laughs> luckily <laughs> we'd actually already planned this, but I thought it was a, a good time to actually uh, make, you, make you jump on the podcast and make it all happen. So Al Kidner, welcome. Uh, cheers, mate. Thanks for having us on. Um, yeah, I hope we haven't discussed everything <laughs> the other day and, and pre-podcast to... Um, so we can have a decent conversation, but yeah, I'm yeah happy to be on, mate, and, and talk stick bows and all the rest of it. That's uh, that's what I've sort of been known for for a very long time now. No, very definitely. Long time. It was uh, it was good. We had a quick catch up call to get to know each other the other day, and to be honest, you you kept me alive. I was I was almost <laughs> part dead driving home, and you you kept me awake, so it was good. <laughs> ah, that's good then. Excellent. Yeah. So, mate, take us back. When does when does um hunting start for you? Uh very early. I grew up. Uh, in a small town west of Cairns and it was your typical small country town where, you know, every kid had an air rifle, every kid had a Shanghai uh, slingshot, every kid or most kids had bows or made bows or, you know, just typical country kids. Nothing was safe around us. (laughs) Um, And I always just, you know, when I was a kid playing cowboys and Indians, I was always Indian. So it um, bows were always something in my I guess DNA as they call it. And then I I distinctly remember, I was not fair what age it was, but uh, two things happened. So I was watching an old 
uh, Robin Hood movie, black and white one, mm-hmm. on the weekend, which had Errol Flynn in it, and uh, it's still a lot of people still watch it today. And I was shooting longbows in it. And I was just mesmerized. I couldn't believe it. And then a part two of that was a, a guy, a young fella down the street. He would had a bow and he bought it. And uh, it was a, a recurve, which I still have. And uh, I bought it off him. And that, this is, that was the journey. And my whole life since then has always been revolved around archery, even though I've you know, spent time in the military, own rifles and all the rest of it. I'm, I'm the diehard uh, traditional bow hunter at heart. Mm. Um, I've owned compounds in the past and I sort of, as a young man, like I guess in my 20s, I sort of went to compounds, went through that. Uh, I blew a couple up and then I, it just come full circle again, went back to sort of shoot. And I just liked the stick bows more. I just, no. you know, they just sang to me, you know, and it's when I explain it to people, it's more of a case of, you know, you, you look at examples of fishing. Some people like fly fishing, some people like, you know, going out on the reef or, or, or that sort of thing. Well, to me, I see traditional bow hunting and shooting stick bows is like fly fishing. Yeah, you're not always going to catch some. You're not always, you know, it's more about you know building your own gear, your own flies, whatever. Um, same with traditional archery. You know, guys will make their own strings, their own finger tabs, uh, their own arrows, uh, their own bows. Even you know, um, yeah, all the way from making a laminated type fiberglass bow down to self bows mm. and then you know, all, even their own back quivers, that side of thing. It's a it's a community when I got into it in my mid-20s, uh, everyone sort of helped everyone. Yeah. And then it's sort of come full circle. I think we touched on it the other day where I see now people are sort of starting to help one another again. Mm. And I guess, you know, to take a leaf out of a page out of Aaron Snyder's book, he helps, you know, countless thousands of people day in, day out from whether it be with the podcast or just messaging people. And that's what it used to be like. And he probably picked that up from, you know, taking up the stick by himself uh, because that's what the community was like. You know, how do I make this or how do I do that or, you know, how do I shoot properly or or whatever. So, and I don't mind helping. And we get just through the business and and myself on social media accounts for phone calls or whatever, um, we get a fair amount of, of people asking questions about you know, traditional archery, and mm-hmm. because there's a big, you know, there's a surge in it, as, as we all know. So people are going, oh, you know, I'm keen to take up a stick bow, and they'll still shoot a compound. Yeah, they want, you know, a bit of advice, and I, I, you know, I'm quite open with that. You know, whether it be arrows or you know what bow to shoot or how much to spend, that sort of thing. And it's same with someone is if they're coming over from a rifle to a to to bow hunting. It's the same conversation you have with those guys. You know, you just get something that'll shoot well, mm. get set up correctly. You know, don't go to BCF and buy a bow. <laughs> um, go to go to someone that's going to set you up. You know, your draw length and, and not you know give you some wood arrows and a sixty pound compound. Yeah. Um, that sort of bad that's scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's plenty of examples of that out there. So that's why you know the traditional archery sort of community saying to me, and I just dive deep into it years and years ago and it's still um it's still got its hook fairly into me and i I probably won't change even though i'm not shooting a bow at the moment due to shoulder injuries Mm -hmm. um but that one the other won't change once that's all fixed and and i'm on deck again it'll be straight back into it yeah definitely it's uh it's interesting you should bring up the community thing just on tuesday night um I went and caught up. James Dempsey was in town. And so I went and caught up with him. And yep. it was um, Sean from Dog and Gun and um, Mitch Warren. And then, um, of course, Sean's wife, Rach, was there as well as Corey, one of the guys that works there. And <clears> we just had this awesome dinner, like the best catch up. We just had the best belly laughs all night. And it was just, it was kind of beautiful to see what bow hunting has done and how it's brought together this community. And people who live in all different parts of the world who have ho- had all different walks of life, yet it still brings you together. Um, yeah. And it's interesting for something that I've been doing for all of three years, yet I, I literally think I've, I've made friends for life from doing it. So it's it's pretty, yeah. pretty yeah. amazing. It kind of made me think about all the people I've met on the journey so far. Um, the guys I've gone hunted, hunting with, like even though really we're um, – like we don't keep in touch that much, we're still – best of mates in that sense it's a yeah, it's a very yeah. interesting camaraderie that you get to build with them so yeah I, I strongly agree with that and i just think i just think bow hunting has done so much for 
I shouldn't just say men, but for men in general, because men are shit at talking. And when it comes to <laughs> a, a, a system like this where they can they can almost shut off and have a single point focus and they go out and they have that camaraderie with, with other men in general, it gives them a little bit of extra purpose or passion and it probably just gives them a little bit of extra drive. Um, and I've heard of many situations in, in the case where guys have just been so almost depressed and, and on the, the verge of taking their own lives, yet a community like this is literally what saved them. So I just think it, it's it's such a strong strong bond that gets built through something that you wouldn't expect it to be, to be I guess. And I think yeah, you, you're dead right there, Matt. I, I honestly think, though, it comes, it touches on a point of being, you know, you're doing something in adversity. In adversity. Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to get that right. So you, you're doing something a bit like, you know, CrossFit what? Yeah. How like that community gets together and, and they do, a, whether it be a, a hero water. Yeah. Con- yeah, and, and it's hard. Mm-hmm. And anyone that's hunted long enough, whether it be rifle, bow, stick bow, whatever, they, they just know that, you know, some days are quite hard in, in the bush, especially if you're not if you're not from that environment. Like if you're and not wrong in saying that if you're born from the city, you're not used to, you know, rough environments. Mm-hmm. But, you know, going, doing a backpacking hunt and it's cold and wet and, and whatever, and then someone else has done that and they're sharing that that hardship with you, that can sort of give a bit of a bond and you can reflect back on that whether you're in New Zealand or, you know, up in the Cape and it's, you know, 40 degree heat or, you know, Brisbane Valley and it's rain and, or whatever. You, you can sort of reflect on that and with you someone else or someone else has been there at that time. Even if they're not in the same camp, they can sort of, uh, I guess, they side with you and they they see the hardship and they yeah, yeah. and that's how it sort of brings people together, that adversity through hardship. And that's, yeah. And like, like I can't, it's not changing my life. It's just been a part of my my whole life as an adult. Mm -hmm. And even even as a kid, like I said before, um, and my grandfather hunted as well. And my father done a little bit of hunting. Um, but it's, it was just sort of part of what, you know, men did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and I guess it's if a family was big into fishing, that would be the same. Like men sitting in a boat fishing or, or where are they going? They're going to let their guard down, have a few beers, you know, and that sort of whole. And and men and women should do that. In their yeah, own. definitely. My, my wife and I spoke about this a fair bit. As I was saying before, she's into hockey and that's her thing. Mm-hmm. And she knows hunting and it is my thing. And we sort of both, you know, fade in and out of each other's um, hobbies and, and sporting events. Um, but we both are very much on the same page that that's their thing and that they need that to sort of be, I guess, get their release and, you Refill know, de-stress. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, and make the most out of life. Shit, we're only here for a very short time. So, and if that, if hunting makes me happy and being in the bush makes me happy and, and feeding my family with game meat and whatever, then so be it, you know. And mm-hmm. I'm lucky I've got a great wife. And, and same, like, if her playing hockey and coaching hockey and, and all that, is that that's her thing? Hey, go for go it. For hey, it. Fill, yeah, fill, fill your boots. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually um, something my wife does is runs women's circles. And essentially, it's a group of women that get together and it's a chance for women who don't have a support network to have a support <clears> network all of a sudden. It's, it, it, she always comes home just absolutely glowing from those nights because she's like, wow, we, we made a difference in some lives tonight and it's pretty cool to see. Yeah. Um, which I think is beautiful, and I think I think really it's kind of the same thing that we're really talking about here. Um, but yeah, it's it's those toxic situations, and uh, one of my best mates to go hunting with, he was in a tox- toxic relationship where he wasn't actually able to go hunting. It was the one thing <clears throat> he grew up doing and loved doing, yet <clears throat> he was the bad person because he was going out and leaving the family behind. Um, yeah. And of course, it ended because it, it's going to go one of two ways, I think. And yeah, it's either you're yeah. going to be depressed and in the relationship, or you're going to be happy and out of it. So he's happy and out of it, and it, it's been the best thing he's ever done. So um, it's just interesting how how it all kind of plays together, and how much of a pull I think the out, the outdoors have on us. Um, going back to the stick bows, it's actually so I bought a recurve as my first bow, and that's right. that's what actually got me into it. I went to a I went to the shop to to buy some slingshot. Um, bands and ended up walking out <laughs> with a bow. <laughs> like then people go to Aldi to buy a steak and they walk out with a garden home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> and ever since it just became this little addiction and the first animal I took was a rabbit with my recurve and yep, then yep. we actually got out onto some pigs 
And I was like, there's no way I'm putting one of these arrows through one of those pigs. Like, it's just mm. not happening. I, I just didn't have the confidence in any of the equipment or anything like that. And my cousin yeah. that I was with at the time, he had this Matthews recurve and he just pumped this pig. I'm like, wow, that's what I need, obviously. Yeah. Um, and yeah. just need to have that confidence change. But my goal is to always go back to traditional bow. And it's something that I do take out to the, the range quite a lot and just have a play with. But... Mm-hmm. Every day I shot that bow. I loved it. And I, yeah. it's like it was just really – I almost felt like I need to shoot it every day to stay in tune with it. I'm sure it's not probably the case. Like now I go and pick it up and I can still shoot it pretty well and I pick it up pretty quickly. But there's a lot of things that kind of come to when you're, when you're talking about traditional archery that is very different from a compound bow. So putting it to basics, um, what style of shooting do you do? Is it inst- instinctual or do you yeah, do so on point? Yeah, I- so I sort of grew up and not grew up. I was in the era when uh, instinctive shooting was the thing. You know, there was books written on it. There mm-hmm. was seminars you could go to. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was it was a big thing. You know, every web forum was all about instinctive archery and you know, how to shoot and, and magazine articles and that sort of thing. So I, and I was taught that originally by uh, a very close friend of mine on how to shoot. And he you use the analogy he said just like throwing a dart at a dart board mm. or you know a cricket ball he said you're not looking or pointing your finger you're just throwing it and using you know what is in our brain to get it there so I just um sort of took all that on board and then yeah so instinctive archery is generally how I I don't aim I just look at the smallest spot I can do and then I try and hit that and it takes a fair bit of you know, knowing your equipment, making sure your bow's tuned, um, making sure your form is correct. Because mm-hmm. the biggest thing with what happens with most guys in instinctive archery is they sort of start to snap shoot and they do that mm-hmm. quick thing because they think, oh, yeah, I'm hitting my anchor as I come through. No, that's not correct. Yeah. And, you know, there's many, there's a couple of different online courses you can do now, like Tom Clum is probably the Jedi master at all. But even he, you know, will say that he started off in instinctive archery and he, had them not bad habits, but probably not the best mm-hmm. form habits. Um, and then you, let's be honest here: like if you're a bow hunter and you're shooting a stick bow, not every situation in the in the bush is going to suit you know like the perfect form. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be sometimes where you're going to short draw, or you're going to have to do a quick shot, or you might have to hold a little bit longer at anchor simply because that's what the situation dictates. Yeah. Um, so I. I sort of had to reset my wiring once I sort of I – sh- I used to shoot okay, don't get me wrong, and I used to shoot ABA rounds and, you know, um, club shoots and all the rest of it with a recurve, wood arrows and all the rest of it, sometimes aluminium arrows. Yeah. Um, but I knew that I wasn't – I could have been better mm-hmm. and it always sort of gnawed away at the back of my head. So – and to cut a long story short, I, I sort of – done a lot of groundwork, I've done a lot of close bail shooting in regards to homework and then just getting my form exactly how I want it because a good friend of mine, a fellow by the name of Mark Kimber, he's got amazing form for a guy that shoots a recurve and he actually taught himself to shoot left-handed as well as right-handed, made bows left and right-handed. And last time I, I'm pretty sure he took both uh, chamois and tar in New Zealand with both left and right-handed yeah, wow. stick bows. So the guy knows what he's doing. Yeah. But his form is, is is pretty much perfect. And he said to me, he sort of picked up on it and he, he calls a spade a spade. He says, you're not hitting your anchor, you're pulling through it, you're snap mm-hmm. shooting. And that sort of burnt me a little bit. I'm like, no, I'm not. You know, I was in denial. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, he, he said, you are. And this is before, you know, we could film each other with phones, phones and all that sort of thing. And he said, and his exact words were, um, you don't see any, an Olympic archer shoot like that, do you? And I went, oh, no, you're right. Mm. So, and then I sort of broke it all down, you know, come to anchor, use your back muscles and then pull through. Yeah. Um, and that, that's how I shoot now. And it, but I still instinctively aim at that target yeah like I, I don't like some guys will say oh my point on is at this distance and all the rest of mm. it I personally don't because I've shot for so long and shot so many million arrows and worked on my my, my anchor and my release and, and you know pushing both with my bow arm and pulling yeah you know through my my anchor that and obviously the last oh, I'd say 18 months I've received a bit of a little bit of tuition off Tom Clum, 
sent him a few videos and he's going, yeah, you, you know, you're nearly there. <laughs> but even he, even, even Tom will sort of pull it apart and go, ah, not this, not that, do this, do that. Yeah. Um, so that, that is me. That's how I shoot. I and mean, when I hunt, like I would have always a, or at least one, but most times two blunt arrows in my quiver. So it'd be a judo or, a, or an actual field so point. Play. Yep. Shoot. And that's yeah, all I do, mate, all day is yeah. I'm, I'm hunting and I'm just going, oh, look at that leaf over there and I'll, I'll do, you know, the perfect shot because, as I said before, the hunting at the animal and, and the situation will dictate how you shoot. Yeah. So if I do everything right, correctly, all the time, like a like perfect form, that's cool. Uh, but if it comes to the crunch and, and, and in a, a, like a, you know, high-pressure situation on shot on an animal where the animal's walking or whatever, I can then lessen that degree of, perfection to mm. just get a shot off but still knowing if i do 90 percent of a right it's still going to go where i go yeah the arrow is going to you know go where i intend it but it, it's one of the things where it's simply just you know a bit like when people say oh how do you get good at push-ups you just do push-ups right, good to the rest. <laughs> yeah. yeah um yeah yeah it's interesting I, I think like so for instance we've we've gone and taught people um stress reduction type product uh, type of breathing tactics and essentially it's to get yourself to jump out of a stress state and um unless you practice that stuff you're never going to be able to be able to put it into place in that that stressful mm. environment um and you hear of people who get in front of a deer and they completely lose it they're they'll shoot a, a cap at 250 meters with their rifle yet you get them to 80 meters to a deer and they they can't yeah. hit the deer and so it's that that same situation you need to be able to calm yourself and be able to do the same process every single time so um yeah it makes a lot of sense definitely so would you think like do you think that's probably one of the best bits of advice you ever got that you were just not stopping on your anchor yeah and i just shoot lots like i personally the more i shoot the better i shoot mm. so if i have a layoff everything just gets tight my shoulders um you know, my back gets sore and I'm, I'm spraying them. Mm -hmm. But if I shoot, you know, every day at home here, I've got a bit of a course around my yard. Uh, and if I go to the, the local archery club two or three times in a seven-day period and then leading up into a hunting season, I'll, I'll shoot, you know, heaps and heaps and heaps and arrows. And not not just like in a, in a bush 3D setting, 3D target setting, you know, close bail stuff in my garage mm -hmm. with a, a target and I'll, I'll just do, you know, shot I'll shoot. Shot process, shot process, yep. shot process. Just, again, yeah. just, and it's like I said before, you know, how to get good at push-ups, you just do push-ups. Same with, but in saying that, you've, you've got to have, make sure that someone is watching you. And I was going to say, how do you get good at bad push-ups, right? Yeah, Doing yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you, you've got to have someone that can sit back and you've got to be able to be teachable. You've yeah. got to be able to be coachable, as we know. So, uh you can't sort of have that thick skin where someone goes, mate, you're not hitting your anchor or you're not, you know, and I'm not trying to overcoach someone either by giving them 400 points that they're not doing right. And they can they get two of them, yeah. you know? So it's a case of making sure that you, you know, gear aside, if you're just talking about shot process, making sure that someone's viewed that or, you know, if you need to go and pay the likes of Tom Clum or someone at an archery club that shoots a recurve well, mm. um, and give you proper tru tuition in, in that regard because it, it will pay dividends. And that old saying, you know, perfect practice, well, no, you have to practice perfect all the time. Yeah. And then, like I said before, and then if you go out into like a bush environment and you do have a dodgy shot, you know, hopefully because you've got that perfect ingrained memory, mus muscle memory, that everything that happens, you know, so quickly uh, that – the, the deer comes there, you, you know, you do a, a, not a lousy shot, but you don't hit your anchor, you sort of pull through and rush it a little bit. Hopefully the motor skills you've got there and those motor patch you've built up still will get that roughly arrow where it should be yeah. as opposed to, you know, if you totally – and, hey, I've totally shot over the back of animals too, so <laughs> I'm, I'm no guru in that regard. Um, and I've missed some close ones and, and I've hit some long ones. And, and yeah, it's um, that's just – archery and, and hunting in general but um yeah well, gear aside it's, it's more a case of correct practice and making sure you know what you're doing with with teaching points and, and be able to yeah shoot correctly gear aside of course, yeah which is, definitely it, it's an interesting thing um that you say that 
I was actually told just recently, you know what, one day you'll give up the you'll give up the wheels and you'll go back to your your recurve because it's you'll learn that it's a faster bow. <clears throat> and at first it didn't really make sense to me. I was like, Can you explain that? Like I don't really understand what you're getting at. And he's like, Well, in close quarters, when you've got mm. the ability to take that quick shot, you can't do that with a with a compound bow. Um and recently I was on on this absolute stellar bore. I didn't know he was there until he was there. And we were yep. literally probably two, two and a half meters from each other. Um, and he's just woken up and just looked at me. He's just blinking <laughs> and looking at me. <laughs> and I'm like, how do I draw this bow back and get this sucker? Yeah, but yeah. By, by the time I, I would have been able to, I think I started draw back and he just took off. Um, whereas in that situation, it would have been a lot quicker to boom, bang. And it would have just been almost a done job. Um, but yeah, I, I do I do wonder about that, that obviously... I think my, my qualms with going out bow hunting with a stick again is the fact that you need to be that down close, right? Like I, I would want to be that down close, I think is probably the better way to say it um, because I'm not confident with the longer shots. And don't, and that's, that's easy features, don't take them. Yes. I mean, and, and you've got to have to, you might go, okay, well, I've hunted with the compound for, you know, one day or, or two days over the weekend. It's a three-day weekend. You know, Sunday I'm just going to have, it's going to be the long bow or recurve day. Yeah. Um, and then I know guys have done that. You know, they leave their, they change bows and good or bad, I'm not quite sure, like that whole switch thing from one weapon to another. Mm-hmm. But definitely like, uh, and in regards to like a, the distance thing, like your confidence grows. And I, and I don't, uh, I don't, not condone, but I, I just don't encourage long shots um, when you first start now. Yeah. Because it's just so, you know, it, it's humbling because you go, oh, that's a, you know, you'll go to an ABA sort of round club or, or, or 3D club and, you know, and there might be 45 metre uh, target there. Yeah. And like 45 metres is a long shot for me. Yeah. And even that is a, is a like a, a wing and a prayer. Like, but I know if, if I get it close-ish and I do everything right, I go, well, I, at 20 metres, that's just, that's dead, mm. you know, or yeah. at 30, it's still dead. Uh, and then same when I, like I said before, in regards to like stump shooting and all the rest of it, I'll do long shots mm. um, for a couple of reasons. The first one is I like seeing arrows fly, yeah. which is the beauty of traditional archery, right? You yeah. get to see these arcing arrows across, you know, a gully or, or whatever. And that's just a cool thing for me, you know, because mm. that's how I grew up as a kid. Um, you know, or if you get in a big paddock, shooting them up in the air and watching them come down. Like, I still love doing that, you know, <laughs> obviously with safety, you know, yeah, yeah, paramount. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, and but also like, I'll take a long shot, like a 45-metre shot or even a 50-metre shot and I'll, I'll, I'll pick at something and I'll, and I'll again, stump shoot at that because I know that if everything's right and it, and it gets close-ish, I, them them close shots like twenty and under they they are literally you know a chip shot. Yeah. I shouldn't say that because I've missed. You know <laughs> I have missed close. Don't worry. Um, but it just if you do everything right and you get close at forty meters or fifty meters, even sixty meters with your recurve, and you're getting a little bit of confidence going. Okay, I might bring that in. And then if something's at fifteen meters, you will just drive it. You know, and whatever aiming method you use, you'll just drive it. And I mean that that comes down to obviously knowing your equipment being having the right bow, the right poundage bow, mm. um, and, and your form being good as well, as well as, you know, arrows relatively tuned. I mean, in my opinion, guys sort of focus a little bit over too much on tuning at the moment mm-hmm. where they could just get away with what works for them. Unless you're like a really good form, you sort of don't need to like really focus. And I mean, I hope people don't take this out of context, but you, you sort of don't need to really focus overly too much on tuned arrows. If you get something in the ballpark mm-hmm. and work on getting your form correct, you can come full circle again and then fine-tune them arrows, if that makes sense. Let's stop and chat about that for a little bit. Like when you're talking about tuning, and so obviously with with the compound arrows, they, they <coughs> kind of come preset, <laughs> right? You don't have to do much to them. Yep, what, yep. what is it in regards to tuning your arrows that you have to do with, with the wooden well, arrows? For wood arrows, oh. So to, to jump around a bit, or hope I don't jump around a bit. So when you make wood arrows, okay, it's got to be the arrow's got to be spined, obviously like a compound, mm-hmm. to suit that particular poundage bow, and that comes with your draw length, what type of bow it is, whether it's a long bow, recurve, whether how where the shelf is, whether it's cut to center or past center. Mm-hmm. Um, it comes to your your broadhead or your point weight, um, how you you uh, 
draw the string, whether you split finger or three under, all them sorts of things come into play when, when, you, when you're tuning a wood arrow, looking for a wood arrow. Now, to jump around a bit, what I do is I, I bear shaft tune, but I bear shaft tune with an aluminium arrow, an old school aluminium arrow. Okay. And then I'll, then I'll spine that to, um, so I'll get that bear shaft tuning right. You know what bear shaft tuning is? Yes, yep. Yep. So I'll bear shaft tune for me. And again, not to down the rabbit hole of, of tuning, but I'll make sure my form is good yes, and everything yeah. is good. And my, my bow quiver's on, the, everything I'm going to do or hunt with is, yeah. is, what you is there. To, yeah. Exactly. And then I'll make sure, yep, I'm shooting well today. Okay, I'll bear shaft these, these shafts just to check or a new bow or something like that. Get it out, bear shaft tune. Okay, that 2219 is, is going well for that particular bow with the correct point weight, cut to length, mm -hmm. no feathers on. Mm -hmm. And I'll just test it and test it and test it. And then I'll step back a bit from, I'll start at like 10 meters. Yeah. Then I'll, then I'll step back 12, 15, and I'll get to about 17 meters and then even at 20. And just bare shaft tune with no border, just a feel point. Mm -hmm. Get that right. And then I, I put that particular aluminium arrow on a spining jig, which yeah. is a two pound weight, mm -hmm. and I'll spine that. And then I'll, I'll then search in the stockpile of shafts that I got for something spined. And I've already got them, they're already, I'll, but I'll check them to that. Yeah. And then that's how I do it because that works for me. And I've actually, when I made out wood arrows for guys, I would tell them to do that mm -hmm. if they could get an aluminium arrow. Yes. Um, so that for wood arrows like that, that's probably the best method. Not many guys, and it's hard um, to to get good wood arrows, and you will pay for them. Wood shafts, I should say. Yeah. Um, and you will pay for them. But I, you know, guys can get full longevity. You know, they can shoot. So there's some really good uh, carbon arrows out there this okay. day and age for you know shooting a stick bow yep. just because you shoot a stick bow doesn't mean you have to shoot wood arrows no. i just like it because it's a bit nostalgic i, I can make a, a quality you know a wood arrow and i still do i still hunt with wood arrows because i know what i'm doing you know yep. like i know like they will weigh a, a dozen made up arrows with broadheads crested with fletching on it i'll get them you know within 15 grains of all of them mm -hmm. that's that's how the you know, the focus I put on, but I'm in no rush. Like I'll, yeah. it'll take me, you know, a good month to make those, but that's what I do, you know. It's part of the art form, right? Yeah, yeah, like a guy that makes flies, he's not making them, you know, for fly fishing. He's, he's not making them, you know, to sell. He probably is, but he's he's doing that because he wants to do that. He yeah. wants to be pedantic. He wants to make sure that they they do what they do as an, you know, as an analogy. Yes, so. go through the process. You know, that was actually going to be one of the questions around the, the carbon shafts then, Um and obviously, there is versions of both that are going to be good and versions of both that are going to be bad. Um, is it just purely because you just like the wooden shafts, you like the process of it, that's why you stick to the wooden shafts? Like, would there, would yeah, there be well, any reason to, for you to go to carbon? No, I've got carbons here. Okay. I shoot carbons as well. I, I shoot carbons um, for a couple of different reasons. If I Travel overseas, I find carbons are easier for me to pack in a, mm -hmm. in a hard case that I got yep. and a takedown bow sits in my duffel bag. I don't have to worry about it, whether it's if I'm taking uh, wood arrows, I need a different case and mm. it's because the broadheads are glued on. Yep. Um, that for me, travelling overseas or an interstate hunt, I'll always take carbs because they're just easier yep, uh, in that right. respect. Yeah, yeah. but for local hunts here, like I've – Bows I've got here now in the garage, um, they've got wood arrows on them now. So, and, and even like a 3D shoot or something to that effect. Um, and I, I chop and change a little bit, don't get me wrong. I love wood arrows and, and we'll always, you know, I've got last count I had over 40 dozen um, wood arrows specifically for me and my bows. So I've been hoarding them for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but mind you, I've got paid for them as well. Like some of there's probably a you know, a couple of dozen in there that I've, that would have cost me, you know, upwards of $80 for a dozen. Yeah. Um, and that's, they're, they're just cut to length. That's it. They're just dowels, wooden yes. dowels, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, and, yeah, but for longevity in regards to, like, in the, in the garage shooting, you know, close work shots working on my form or working on my release or anything, I'll just shoot carbons because it's just, you know, the longevity of a carbon arrow. Yeah, um, okay. And there's, there's, there's a couple of good brands out there, like, uh, the gold tips are, are, 
are quite okay. For the, like the traditional wood look ones are mm-hmm. quite fine. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, I'm just trying to remember some other brands now. I, I used to shoot um, a couple of full tapered ones. There was a company called Grizzly Stick or still there is still a company called Grizzly Stick. I shot them for a number of years, but they were quite expensive. So I sort of had to go somewhere else uh, and they'll shoot a, an aerodynamics shaft, which is, a, again, a full tapered shaft. Yeah. Um, only because I like tapered shafts mm-hmm. uh, for a number of different mm-hmm. reasons. But I bought a stack of them years ago when they were good and apparently the quality isn't there quite now. But okay. uh, from what I've heard, anyway. but there, there are a number of good quality shafts that you could shoot out of any stick bow. Um, yeah, that, and I'll probably look at, you know, making another big buy up. Yeah. yeah. And so when it comes to tuning your broadheads, is there any difference you need to do or it's pretty much because you, you're, um, you've you tuned your yeah. arrow correctly, there's, there's nothing to well, you, worry about? Well, you've, if you've tuned uh, your broadhead, sorry, your, your field points and bear shaft, they're flying where you want to and all the rest of it, everything's sort of lining up for you. The biggest thing, the mistake I see people is they – uh, they then think that a broadhead must be horizontal or vertical mm. on their on their shaft. Doesn't matter a, a hoot. Mm-hmm. Um, it has to spin through. Yes. So if you're making wood arrows, it, there can be no wobble in in that. Like, and that's what you pay for good wood arrows because a, a good Fletcher will make sure that they're straight as you can possibly get them. So obviously, a broadhead on the front is going to steer. So if it's out of whack, if it's not in in the going through its paradox. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll want to steer that to where, where it needs to go. And what I used to do, uh, I used to go to like local sand dunes. I used to live near the beach yeah. and I would just go and shoot broadheads down there, like find okay. a spot where no one's around and I'll just shoot and go, oh yeah, that one flies good. That one flies good. Oh, check that one. And I'll just shoot if there's one not doing where it needs to go. Mm. Um, nine times out of 10, if I literally flip that over on the string, and have the knock facing the other way, like knock tune as they yes, call yeah. it, it'll go where it's meant to go. <laughs> it's just a the, the dynamics of it going through the dynamic spine, because it's timber, it's probably doing its own thing. Yes. And and you actually and I've been anal enough to um I've actually spined carbon arrows and <laughs> and uh yeah, <laughs> making sure they're all like in the same where I'll put the knock on, I'll make sure that they actually line up as well. So yeah. and and so with your spin tuning, um, is, is that the only way to do it? Like I, I know I've seen obviously the test where you just spin it on the spot, um, on the point. Obviously, you've also got your, your spinning wheels that you can do it on. Yeah, um, I do it on a deck. wheel. So yeah. I got a, I made a roller. This has got uh, like these, oh, I forget what. I just went to Bunnings and made up a roller on an aluminium bit of channel. Mm-hmm. And I just will, and I use that to straighten my wood shafts as well. Yeah. Um, so... Pretty much the last thing I do is glue on my field points or my broadheads when I make an arrow. Yeah. Uh, and that's because I've, I've literally hand straightened that uh, talking wood shafts now. And even this goes for compounds, sorry, not compound, but um, carbon or aluminium shafts as well. Like if guys glue in or if they cut an aluminium shaft, not 90 degrees, mm-hmm. and same with the carbon shaft, your insert will then, or your exactly. outsert will then be slightly out of whack. And that'll cause an arrow to wobble. Mm, yeah. Uh, and you'll notice it a heat more with it with a compound. And you'll notice it a little bit. And some guys won't shoot good enough to notice it, mm-hmm. but they'll know if they're shooting a group of arrows and one's always a flyer. Yes. That they, yeah. Like I said before, that could be an issue. So yeah, and I, I just roll them on that, uh, that roller. And then I'll just have a little mark on the on the bench and I'll just roll it. And if you if it's not straight, it'll just wobble against that mark. Yeah. Okay. You know, and some, yeah, you can really spin them and get them singing on that particular uh, little apparatus, and then you'll you'll notice any wobble. Yeah, definitely. Um, That's mm. cool. And that, and that comes down to carbon arrows as well. Like, if not all carbon arrows are, are good, um, as we know. Like, you pay for what you get to a degree. Mm. Um, but like I said before, if you're if you've cut the knock end or whatever, and you've cut that crooked or it's been cut crooked, then yeah, it's it's you're going to have issues with it. And same with your knock alignment. Yep. Knocks, you know, need to be they're, – they're extremely important that they're straight onto uh, – glued onto your arrow correctly because if that's the last thing leaving the string. So mm-hmm. if your knocks out – it's not straight as well, yeah, it'll um, push, you know, give you give you all sorts of dramas and nightmare and you'll have hair greyer than mine. <laughs> and so how many bows do you have? 
Well, I'll just check if my wife's around. <laughs> <laughs> we got a saying in my house that when I die, um, my wife's not to sell anything that's <laughs> <laughs> what I told her I bought it for. <laughs> yeah, so, no, he said he was going to give it to me as a gift, I swear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This, this bow only cost him $90. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, last count, and, and some of these bows I've had, like I've got my first bow that I ever bought as a kid. I've still got that bow. It's a Ben Pearson fiberglass recurve, 35 pound. I still got it. It yeah. still shoots. Awesome. Um, I'd probably have... Uh, in with longbows, I've got probably three or four longbows, uh, and then takedown bows like takedown three piece um, stick bows. I would have one, two, three, about four of those. And then on, my last one I bought was a big Jim Thunderchild, which is sort of like a heavy reflex deflex, short, shorter longbow, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and it, it sings an arrow. It, it's, yeah, but it, it's a typical shorter, lighter bow where it just takes a little bit more uh, wrangling in, in order to get as accurate as I can be. So the best bows I shoot personally for me is um, a Black Widow PSA mm -hmm. or, a, or a PCH is the one i got here now. And I've probably owned in the past five of those. Yeah. Regretfully sold them all and for, you know, horse trading and, Yes, yeah. Grass is always greener, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, but I've made a decision now I'll never sell another stick bow again. There's yeah, probably okay. a few there's probably a few uh stick bows kicking around Australia with my name on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, especially a couple well, it's funny because a guy down in Victoria reached out to me on social media. I've never met him, but he said, uh, did you by having a chance to own a longbow? Uh, this poundage, blah blah blah. And he sent me a few photos and I said, Yeah, that's my bow. And he goes, Yeah, well, I got it. And I went, Good. Can I have it back? <laughs> Every now and then he'll send me photos of it. He's like, I saw your bow, but uh, he, <laughs> he's not. He's in. not. Yeah, he's not wanting to part with it. So, but um, I, he did say that when he's when he's tired of it, he'll sell it back to me at, at the, the price he bought it for. So, okay. nice. I'm, I'm I'm hanging out. But yep. uh, hope and it's a nice. It's actually a nice. It's a it's a, a black widow longbow, but I got the grip changed on a little bit to bit more palm swell in it yeah, for okay. me because I'm I'm more of a recurve shooter. Yeah. Um, so I just spoke to the guys at Black Widow, and they I said, "Look, can you just beef up the palm?" And they went, "Yeah, sure, no worries at all." Uh, got it a takedown, sent out here, and yeah, just in a moment of week, and I was in a pretty ordinary spot in my life anyway, and I just went, "That bow can go. I haven't shot it," mm. and. I, I regret it now, and I've done that with a lot of bows. And as I said before, I won't sell another stick bow again. I'll just keep them, yeah. you know. And because it's like you guys sort of go through this holy grail of looking for, you know, the the best of the best bow. Yeah. And they, yeah. And of the bows I've got here now, they all shoot well for me. Um, some I shoot a little bit better. Some I have to concentrate on a little bit more. And there's other bows I've got here, just sentimental, that yes. you know, I'll, I'll never shoot again. Um, they were you know, given to me by guys that are no longer with us or, mm -hmm. or you know, I've picked up or they just have a lot of sentimental value and I'll never string them again because if they broke, I'll just probably turn white, you know. Yes, yeah. um, so they just sit up on the bow rack and, you know, tell a bit of a story if anyone was yeah 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 and but, so so have you hunted with all those bows along the, the tracks or the ones that were given to you just more so always been monumental uh a bit of both um a couple of them i've, I've hunted with uh one uh, sort of heavy reflex deflex longbow there was a it was a cut a long story short it was my bow then it was bill baker's then it was my bow then it was bill baker's <laughs> and he passed away with the bow and, and the it, when he died, um, part of his yeah last will and all the rest of it was that bow was to come back to me. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I've still got it here. It's yeah, I, I'll never string it. I, I thought about doing it up because the, the finish is sort of going on it, and I thought, no, nah, I'm done. I just I would never forgive myself if, I, if it blew up or yeah. you know I went hunting or I lost it or, or something happened. You know, it's it's done it's it's done a sort of time. So yes, yeah, but the other the other bows, um, yeah, I've. I sort of a little bit sort of chop and change. I'll, I'll get a feeling for one bow uh, and then I'll, I'll, um, it'll just get a run for a year or two, you know, and then I'll, I'll another bow will just strike my fancy and I'll, I'll pull that out, whether it be, you know, um, another takedown recurve or, or a long bow as such. So, but I'll, yeah, for me personally, like if you're going to travel overseas or whatnot, like a takedown is obviously a must. And then 
you'll pay more for a takedown as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the initial price that you'll pay, um, you know, it, it, it's nothing compared to being able to travel to Africa with it, New Zealand with it, back to the States mm -hmm. with it. And it, it's in your duffel bag. It's rolled up in your – and that's how I do it. I just have it in a, a bow yeah, case. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, rolled up in me in my clothes. I've never had an issue with it, um, and all my bows I've travelled with, and that's it's the you'll pay for it, like I said initially, mm -hmm. but then that's nothing compared to the life you could get out of that bow. And there's heaps of stick bows in Australia now, like yeah, definitely, yeah, guys selling them and and, and yeah, guys buying them from the states and they Plenty think of black that, widows getting about. There is a lot of black widows getting about, and I. I I don't know why, uh, other than guys just chasing that holy grail of another bow, or you know they, it, they, they order it and they think, yeah, this will be the last bow I ever. And I've said that to myself like <laughs> probably about fourteen times. This is the last stick bow. This bow is going to be the awesome thing. And you'll have it for six, eight months, and then the novelty wears off. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's like, eh, it's just a bow. Um, <laughs> you know, but and. I, Hey, there's nothing wrong. Like, like I said, I've owned five Black Widows and they are awesome bows. Mm -hmm. um, what I do believe is guys sort of, they may buy bows and a little bit over bow. They think they need 60 pounds and they don't. Yeah. And they realise what 60 pounds is when someone points to them or they go and do the likes of a Tom Clum uh, course mm. and you've got to hold 60 pounds. Like, oh, you know, and oh, I'm my God, comfortable... Yeah. Well, my comfortable weight is 63. All my bows are from 60 to 65, but I like 63. Um, for me, I can shoot that quite well and not have to. I can put it down, pick it back up um, with not really, you know, getting that shock of, oh, uh, that's a 67-pound bow or that's a bit. And I used to own a set, a couple of 70-pounders, sold them, and that's not why I got shoulder issues, by the way. Um, <laughs> it was more of a case of, I really had to focus on shooting those 70 pound bows because mm -hmm. I just took a lot of work and a lot of, you know, extra work after yes. hours in regards to, you know, shoulder mobility, uh, keeping fit, yep. um, and just doing basic shoulder exercises like chin ups and push ups and dips. So, you have lat strengthening pieces. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's, um, so yeah, that's why I, I dare say a few. Black Widows are getting around. Guys are just overbowed. Yeah. Now, I'm, again, sick of them. Oh, so. oh, you know what? I've never heard anyone talk bad about them, though. At the, the no, no, they're like, good. Yeah, people love them when they get them. I rate them. They hold them for yeah. a long time. Yeah, um, and, you'll, and you'll obviously pay for them whether you buy that new or secondhand. You 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 know, you'll, they're like a Land Cruiser. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say anything more. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, how about in regards to hunting with a... With a just a stick bow in general what's what's maybe let's throw maybe one of your favorite hunts out there um oh. keep me in mind that i've been told that you need to come back on just to talk about africa alone as a, <laughs> as a talk in itself yeah. apparently so yeah that's a that's a hell of a that's and all honestly matt i could talk africa and hunting africa for hours and i'd probably bore the living hell out of uh, your, that's your, your we'll, listeners we'll have to do but, a part two then we can do a part two if you like, but that's probably my favourite place to hunt and I've, I've been lucky enough to hunt and when I say lucky, I made these things happen in life. Yeah, so I didn't, definitely. no one knocked on my door and said, hey, Al, uh, we, you know, we're going to Africa, we're going to North America, we're going to New Zealand. Um, I made those things happen because I wanted to personally go there and I'm not done with that yet. Mm. Obviously, you know, with the COVID, hopefully that's getting back to normal and we can start to see more overseas travel again. Uh but Africa sort of holds that special place. And it's funny because a lot of guys have been to Africa. Uh, they all say the same thing. It's like it just it just gets into your soul. It, mm. And I dead set feel like it is my second home. Yeah, uh, it, It's a weird feeling. And even my wife, she'd never been there. And I'd been there before when we went back there when I took her there the first time. She said the same thing. She goes, oh, this just feels like home. I said, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a primal thing. Mm. It's like it, – and – you know, whether we all, all are or were yeah, from yeah, Africa, right, yeah. got the who knows? Yeah. You yeah. Look, you get your genes tested. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we're probably all related somewhere, six of us. <laughs> um, but I, I just grew up on adventure. I grew up on, you know, the more black and white films of John Wayne in Africa and all the rest of it, Errol Flynn and, and, and Howard Hill and, and the likes of it. And it was just the adventure of it. And then... I, I read a lot, so I got a lot of books. And then anything you know, I like to read is obviously about hunting or, or 
you know, military side of things as well. Uh, so a lot of hunting books I got is on Africa, and I've got a lot of friends that have been to Africa, and I've, mm-hmm. you know, I'm lucky enough I've been there three times on three separate hunts or, or occasions, and the longest was three week stretch. Yeah, wow. And that was amazing, and, and they are like probably gems in my memory of mm-hmm. life. You know, that just mm-hmm. my wife and I, we can sit back and go, "Hey, remember that time when we were here and we were there and we did that?" You know, and it just you just get this glow. You know, yeah. <laughs> but in regards to hunting, there like it. It, it and it's like anything, you know. You, you not pay for what you get, but if you do your homework, you can really go to some excellent, excellent hunting operations over there. And now, as I said before, obviously with COVID, lack of hunters or world travel, they are actually screaming and they're, they're they're opening up slowly in different areas. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of opportunities for some really, and I mean, I only know like a, a drop in the ocean of of, of hunting operations over there. But, you know, I've had some guys say to me, oh, it's just like shooting, you know, fish in a barrel. I said, no, it's not, not at all. You know, you can go there and have a, a really great experience and see Africa in that true wild um, place. And there's heaps of opportunities to do that there. Um, but probably the best trip I'd ever been there was one, my last trip there. And I, I hardly hunted at all. I went there as a bit of a... It was a bit of a last minute dot com. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we had a few too many beers and wines, and I was a bit in between jobs. Yeah. And um, my mates were literally going in a week, and we're all catching up. And they said, "Hey, you should come." And my wife looked at me, and goes, "Yeah, you should go." And I went, "Okay, I'll go." That's all I need. Yep. <laughs> and it was scrambling next day to to buy flights and all the rest of it. And it was probably because it was no, and I wasn't going as a on a specific hunt. Yes, I did take my bow. But it was more. I just went there with friends to take photos, mm-hmm. catch up with with friend, friends over there. There was no expectation. There was no pressure on me. Mm-hmm. So if I wanted to sleep in of a morning over there, which is very hard to do, I might add, <laughs> um, just the excitement level of yes. being in Africa. Um, and I just wandered around. I took my camera. I I, I did a few hunts. So I missed a shot on a on a little Steenbok ram, mm. um, just by myself out in the bush. Uh, look, I hung a lot with the trackers because there was paid clients in this particular camp yep. and I was paying a daily rate anyway, you know, to cover food and laundry and lodging, that sort of thing. Um, but it was sort of a bit of a mate's race in regards to the hunting side of things. And then I spent a lot of time with the trackers, just following them around, like learning off them. These guys could hardly speak English, but to watch them track and to be offered a tracker, mm. you know, by the PH going, well, you go with this guy, um, you know, see you, you know, lunchtime or whatever, we'll come back for lunch. I was like, yeah, see you later. And, we're, you know, we're walking up into all these foothills, we're finding, you know, leopard kills, and then all, all these warthogs were dragged way up into these, oh, they weren't hot, they call them copies. So they're like small foothills of, of granite and, and boulders in sort of that typical African savanna um, area. And, you know, they might be, say, a couple hundred metres high, but we got up into one and the tracker and I found all these skulls. So there's like these leopards who were killing warthogs way down the bottom on the sort of the valley or you'd imagine the African bush, the veld, mm. and dragging these, you know, these warthogs, probably half their body weight, through all these rocks that you're sort of rock hopping, these big boulders, yeah. into like a, an area where they'd stashed and then ate their kill there. Mm. And then they would leave again. And we actually heard that leopard a couple of times. And I tried to get a photo of him, which is another story for another time. But it's a very, uh, let me say, a very eerie feeling when the whole bush goes quiet. Can imagine, yeah. And it's dark and all you've got is a pocket knife. (laughs) Because I was trying to get a photo of a particular leopard and I heard him coming and all the baboons are screaming and whatnot. And I'm like, yep, I'm going to get my photos. I'm just in settings on my camera. It's set up on like a a bar stool of all things on it on a couple, a couple of gun bags and I was like just adjusting the settings and going, yep, and it was on a, a kudu kill and they brushed me in this blind and I could hear, I knew this leopard was coming because I could hear him coming through. He moved a couple of rocks up in the in the foothills, knocked over rocks and the baboons just went off. They were just screaming everywhere. I went, yep, he's coming in, come in. And then everything just went dead quiet. Like you couldn't hear nothing. Mm. I was like, oh, yep. And now it's dark. <laughs> and then 
I didn't know it at the time, but my mate, when we, they come back, picked me up in the Land Cruise about half an hour after that when it went dark and we were all talking away and we're having a few beers back at the the area where the huts were and whatnot. And he goes, didn't I tell you, Al, that when leopards come in, they go around behind anything they don't <laughs> like? And I was like, well, now you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, yeah, the only time I felt really worried and that they offered me, my mate's got a, a 500 Nitro, which is like, a pretty big rifle. He said, you want to take the 500? I went, no, no, I'll be right. I just got me pocket knife on my belt. He goes, no, no, take take the 500. I went, no, no, that's all right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And they're all sort of looking at me like, you probably should have taken the 500. Yeah, (laughs) thanks thanks for that. But that was probably one of them. I mean, they're all good trips, but that was just... And there there was just no pressure on me. Like a lot of guys will get to Africa and they'll feel the pressure. Oh, I must... When you're putting that much sort of money down, right? It's hard not to feel pressure. Yeah, that and pressure of, you know, shooting game correctly because they, mm. like, yeah, I'll, I'll sure say it all. Sort of thing. Oh, not so much that, but just the, sl- the, the slow, dumb African animals died out about 10 years ago, mm-hmm. 10 million years ago, I should say. So they're just wired. Like, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, yep. they, they are so tuned into changes in, in, in their environment to noise, to smell, uh, and that's why a lot of guys will go, oh, you know, sitting in, and I've done some blind hunting, some spot and stalk, tree stand hunting in Africa. And it's all relative to where you are mm-hmm. and, and enjoying that moment. Because um, believe me, you go to Africa and, and a lot of guys will do it. They go, oh, I'm on a spot and stalk. Yeah, cool. Come on, we'll talk day four. Because you will literally have your ass handed to you yeah. time and time again by animals that will spot you so far away. You go, how, how is that? Why are them zebra even looking at me? Like they're like five, six hundred meters away. They're just so sharp and they're just so ready for anything to sneak up on them in the bush. So, for you to lay in the bush and, and move a little bit, you know, you and other animals take their cues off. Yeah, yeah they, they just so if it's some wildebeest over here see zebra looking, then then they all look mm. and they take their cues off, you know, birds or, or whatever. You so think about big cats, right? Like how stealthy they are. And then you try to put a human, a big old dirty yeah. human walking through the bush. It's uh, yeah. <laughs> no yeah, surprise yeah. they pick you up. <laughs> yeah. And, and and even hunting with the trackers, like eh, just their eyesight and even my pH. And he's grown up in, and that's what he does for a living. Um, and he's a good friend of mine. And he's, even his eyesight is so sharp because, A, they're probably used to seeing the shapes or the outlines of certain animals yeah, mm. because they're just used to seeing in that. Yeah. But the, the trackers are – next level, you know, their eyesight and half of them got malaria. So their eyes are crap anyway, yeah. but <laughs> they're all bloodshot. Yeah, yeah. And like they'll look at stuff and look at stuff and look at stuff. And for the life of me, like one particular situation, I could not see what this guy was. And he propped and I'd prop behind him. Yeah. And we didn't talk. We just knew there was an animal there and I could not see anything. I slowly got my binos out and he's in front of me and I slowly raised him up and I just creeping around his shoulder and just looking between his head and his shoulder space. Yeah. And I'm scanning and I couldn't see a thing for ages. And he didn't move. Like he just froze. And probably a good, I don't know, at least 15 minutes, I just see this little ego. Hmm. I went, and he was like, yeah, there's two of them there. And I couldn't even see the second one. You know, <laughs> So but that's how that's sharp they're all. But, but they, they grow up in that environment. Yeah, exactly. So that's what but they... He's not using binos or anything, is he? He's just... No, it's naked eye. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like they... Very, you won't, you'll hardly see a tracker carry a set of binos. Um, yeah. th- they do have them. No, I'm not saying it's a that's a rule of thumb, but uh, most times I've been there, they, they won't have binos, and it's not because they, they, just, they don't need them, it's just like a white man thing, I guess. Um, <laughs> and, and the affordability, I was gonna say, a luxury, right? Really, yeah. yeah. And if they do get given a set, they'll probably sell them, yeah. which it happens, you know, like a track, yeah, trackers will get knives like given to them as gifts or whatever. Or, as a bonus, you know, if they did good on a hunt or whatever from different hunters that go there and then they, they generally sell it, no, it'll you know. Be, so it feeds the family a bit more, right? It does. It, like cash or them, they might need, you know, a new phone because yeah. they all like phones. Yeah, yeah. So they'll just, well, i got three knives. I really don't like this knife. And that's yeah. not disrespectful. They just they just don't see it like it's a gift. Oh, I must keep this till I die. No, no they, they just... service, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So... But yeah, it, Africa is something else. And I, we were planned to be back there 2020. We all know what happened there. Uh, then last year, and then we are aiming to get back there this year. We, we're lucky. We've still got flights that um, Just keep we can moving. still use. Yeah. 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 I mean, a lot of people 
didn't mm. haven't got that luxury. So um, we aim to get back there this year, hopefully, see how we go. Um, but, yeah, and we, we, we will be going back to the same place over in Namibia. Yeah, how yeah, good. Yeah, it is something else. Um, and how about in regards to the Australian species? What, what have and haven't you done? Is there still plans to knock more off here or...? Yeah, and a lot of that stuff, like, again, my shoulders have sort of held me up and I sort of stopped two steps forward, one step back in regards to getting them right and hopefully on, you know, the next six months I'm I'm, I'm in the clear. Mm. Um, But in the past, like, I spent a lot of time up in, when I lived in towns or when I was in the army, I used to, you know, it's on the doorstep of of great chittle hunting, you know, and then they literally... Yeah, beautiful. And I had great access to a, a, a property up there, um, good numbers of chittle deer, and they are very humbling as well, especially mm-hmm. for someone, you know, with, with a recurve or longbow. And I, I was lucky enough I shot three uh, in my time there with a stick bow and wood arrows. Yeah, and, I mean, that was – I shot probably over 300, you know, and, and under another 300 and probably had another 300 deer <laughs> jump the string. So yeah. um, they're just so – again, like they're a native of India, the yes, chittle deer. So they're used to – not only that, but they're used to tigers. Mm. Like it, they're born and bred in, in India and that's what they're known in their DNA of a tiger trying to sneak up to them, you know, in the Indian bush. That That is hard to unwire. Mm. So – and for rifle owners, chittle can be quite easy because I'll stand out and look. Yes. In their group numbers and you get their magnificent chittle, you know, the stags will stand up and they'll have their neck out and they'll just look at you and they'll bark and carry on. Mm. For, so for rifle hunters, they're not that difficult other than shot placement and they're not as big as deer as what people think they are. The stags are good body stags, um, don't get me wrong, but they, and they've been extremely challenging for, for bow hunters. Yeah. And I, I know a lot of guys that have, have, have pushed you know, a number of chittle around the basalt country um, and, and not, you know, come home empty-handed. No, they dead set I've hunted that many times on the basalt and, and come home empty-handed. It's just – and, yeah, I shot a – I lost count how many I shot with a rifle for culling for a mate of mine on his property in the drought, which mm-hmm. was, you know, heartbreaking, but it just had to be done. So we had a method to that that we'd only shoot stags that were, didn't look any good or yeah. – um, you know, uh, hinds, does, as they call it, as well. And then we would take the meat off them and mm. that sort of thing. But, it, yeah, they were probably the worst drought they had up there. So I lost count. I didn't. I wasn't counting. I didn't even take a photo of, of shooting them with a rifle because it just wasn't, you know, rifle is a precision tool made for one thing. Um, it, to me, and guys will probably take this the wrong way, but to me it's not what, how am I going to word this correctly? To me it's not hunting if that makes sense to me no yeah i mean that's that. fair enough and i think it's it's when you've um when you've worked with guns your whole life and uh, i've been i've been talking to a police officer recently and a good mate of mine and he he was saying like with a rifle you just you cannot undo what you do with a rifle like as soon yep. as you pull that trigger it's done like it's done yeah so there is so much so much that has to come into play with that um and so much safety that needs to be taught but at the same time I can understand completely if you've been with it your whole life. Why? Why essentially your style of hunting is completely different to that now? Or yeah, your outlook yeah. On hunting is different to that now. Yeah, and I mean, I, I've got rifles here, and I'm currently getting another rifle made. Uh, uh, again, just for, and all it will be is just a a bit of fun with some mates of mine, and also just to, as a meat getter, mm, like a, yeah. take that out um, and to knock over, head shoot a couple of deer for meat, and that, that's pretty much all it is and I've always liked rifles but I'll always be a bow hunter at heart because yeah. um, that's just how I am you know and obviously spending you know a good portion of my adult life um, in the infantry firearms all the rest of it um, and you know so I've got some good good mates who are, are rifle hunters and, and extremely knowledgeable rifle hunters on you know building rifles calibers uh, a couple of them are former snipers SF guys uh, and they know what they're doing, and then it's <laughs> probably not the best friends to have because then that just increases. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, I need to go and get. Arm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need to go and buy this rifle now. Yeah. You know, so and the wife rolls her eyes. But um, I mean, I've got nothing against rifle hunters. There's some really ethical rifle hunters out there, and I'm, it's yeah. to me, it's just a tool. If that makes better, yeah, you definitely. know, puts it in a better light. Not that it's not hunting. It's just it, to me, it's just a tool. I would rather shoot. 
you know, a long barrel recurve at a deer than than shoot him for 200 metres and walk up to him. So yeah. that, that's just, again, my it's, point of view. It's interesting because I've, I've definitely thought about um, going and getting my, my licence and getting a rifle just to, exactly what you said, just to be mm. a, a meat getter. Because realistically, mm. on the weekend, the last weekend I went up to the farm, which is when we talked last, was um, when there was big floods and I went up just purely to help them. Yeah, yep. they were. They pulled in. I think forty five minutes before light was down. So I quickly ran up the back of the hill and I saw it. Mm-hmm. And so I had had my bow with me, which meant that I just rushed the whole process. I was yes. fighting yeah. this light, but I saw her at eighty meters. So all I would have had to do was bang, and it would have mm-hmm. been a completely job done. Just get to walk it out, sort of the situation. Yep. Um, Put it in the freezer. Yeah. Exactly right, and that's that's been most of my most of my hunting. Like it, with a rifle, it would have been a job done. At least if I could shoot the rifle. Well, I'm not saying that that's the easy process because I know I know a lot of people. Yeah, like, you still miss. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's definitely crossed my mind many times to just go out, fill the freezer. Because at the end of the day, I, I do do a lot of it for meat hunting. Like that's yeah, what, yeah. I, as much as I love bow hunting, as much as I've fallen in love with the the whole process of it. At the end of the day, I still want to bring meat home for my family. And if that oh, means yeah. taking a rifle out, shooting one, and then going and bow hunting for the rest of the weekend, then that's something I'm happy to yeah. do. And a lot of guys do that. You know, I know heaps of guys that hunt, you know, with both. And, and mm. again, it's, it's good on them. You know, they're, yeah. they're getting, getting both their fix. They're filling, you know, the soul of, you know, spending time, you know, because bow hunting, as we know, is a challenge. You know, mm. so it's quite a hard thing. It's not an easy thing. And not everyone can do it successfully. And some of the guys that do do it successfully, you know, hats off to them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, a rifle, especially a well made rifle, sighted in correct calibers and all the rest of it, yeah, you, know, you can get some really accurate, precision made guns these days. And that's all they do. Like they're just mm. a tool of, of, you know, knocking something clean. And that's why, you know, guys with cull deer for a living, that, they got a rifle. Yeah, that's what it does. <laughs> yeah. Not too um, many of them with a the bow, is there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yeah, I, and I, I've done it heaps of times. I lost count, and I'll still do it. I'll probably do it next weekend. I'll just throw the three hundred eight in the car and mm-hmm. um, go and knock a couple of deer for meat. And it, I won't even take a photo. It's just a purely a shopping shopping excuse. You know, and I still enjoy going bush. Still enjoy shooting. I'm still, you know, it's my rifle. Bringing meat home, all the rest of it. And, but it also, um, I guess, it refreshes it with breaking down a deer, you know, that whole meat recovery as well, yeah, um, that sort of thing, until you really get that down pat. And then there's the cooking side of things that, you know, you, you think, oh, okay, well, this this I'm going to do, you know, smoke it this way, this time I'm going to use this, you know. And, and this year I want to, my goal is to um, do salami, venison salami. Yeah, so that's my goal this year. Yeah. So, and I've, I've sort of got a few things in the, in the works of making that happen. Um, and then, you know, that's, that's a, just an aspect of, you know, shooting and, and, and rifle hunting and, and, you know, just because someone hunts with a rifle doesn't mean they're a bad person. And same with, no, definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> same with, a, you know, go, you know, and you're always going to get that, oh, he shoots a compound or, you know, I'm better than him because I shoot a stick bar. You know, you're always going to get that, but whether that's, you know, a bit of lighthearted humor or I think anyone that takes that seriously probably shouldn't be doing it. Or, you know, it's all probably doesn't have many friends. Or well, it's just the it's the dick swinging, dick swinging yeah. ego competition that yeah. all men have in general, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, you can it over, does you have. can overstep it pretty easily as well. Well, you see it, you see it in the gym, don't you? Oh, exactly <laughs> right. yeah. I suffer it every day. Yeah. <laughs> you sure you did all them reps? Yes, yeah. I did, coach. <laughs> um, I have to talk on the on the cooking front. I literally just. Um, bought this yakitori sauce from Woolies the other day and put right. it on um, – I chopped up a round and usually I wouldn't mm-hmm. use a round for steak, but I chopped it up and used it for steak. Mm-hmm. And this sauce, I just chucked it in a container and let it sit for over – it must have been like close on 18 hours. Yep. Um, but it was that good. And I just barbecued it on the Weber and I just got to share it with everyone. It's the, the Fitlock and Sons. Oh, sorry, F Whitlock and Sons it is, now that I zoom in quite properly. It's a yakitori sauce, just a marinade. And um, just buy it from all these, five bucks or something like that, $4.50 I think it was even. And it was it just made this meat incredible. Like yeah, I'm, right. I'm longing to do it again. So, um, yeah, that's a hot tip um, for everyone. <laughs> I, and just on that, like, I think a lot of people get turned off by venison because they've had a, you know, it hasn't been prepared correctly for them. Mm. They've had someone, you know, treat it like steak, Dry the shit out and go, yeah. there's your venison. And you're like, yeah, 
okay, I was going to chew on an old football boot. Um, <laughs> but like we, I've done some meals here and I've also had some pretty ordinary feeds of venison through, not through the animal, but more through my lack of prepping it properly. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I smoke the 99% of my venison here at home. Like I've got a mm-hmm. smoker. So I'll pull out, you know, a hind leg or whatever piece I've got there, rump, um, even back straps, smoke them. And I'll sort of, yeah, for me, or we'll make pies. We do a lot of venison pies, yeah. make different mixes. So we'll we'll do that over a, over a weekend. Mm-hmm. So everything goes into the slow. We've got two slow cookers. Everything goes into them on a Saturday. Yeah. And it just slow cooks all weekend on low. Just keep stirring it, that, you know, add what you want. And then Sunday, Sunday night is when we actually make the pies in the pie mix. Yeah. So it's all thick. Yeah, and, and and heaps of flavour in it. As I say, stews and curries always taste better the second time around yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> as um, leftovers. But uh, that's what we do. You know, we, we do a lot of pies, uh, smoke a lot of the venison. Um, yeah, and I, I find for me that that's for us and our family, that, that just suits us, you know. And I, yeah. he, there's heaps, like you jump on YouTube, there's that many different guys out there cooking different cuts of venison or, you know, and again, coming full circle, what we were saying before in regards to the hunting community, guys passing on that information. Mm. Um, like, I didn't even know this chap. I, I, he was sent to me from a friend of a friend on Instagram because I mentioned, you know, about salamis. And he goes, I talked to this guy. He does them all the time. And I, I said, hey, mate, this is me. Um, my my goal is this year to do salamis. Can I get some information? He's like, yeah, let me know when you're ready and I'll give you a recipe and all the rest of it. And I, I haven't even met the guy. He yeah. just was open. And I mean, that's how we should be. Yeah, you know, yeah. it, it, it shouldn't be this black magic, dark art, you know, Jedi <laughs> mind skills that, <laughs> you know, oh, we, we can't pass on my secret recipe. No, you're not Colonel Sanders, just help. <laughs> so, yeah, and that, again, that, because we have a bit of a tradition here in our house, Sunday night, uh, <laughs> doesn't even have to be a Sunday night, but we do sundowners where we'll sit on their back deck have a few alcoholic beverages, you know, and whether it be um, a bit of uh, venison jerky or something like that, which I do a heap of jerky as well, mm-hmm. we'll sit there and eat that and then, you know, talk about the weekend or whatever. But just to have salami that I've shot, you know, um, it's it, it's that whole good vibe. Um, and, all again, some of the best meals we've had as a family of sitting down here with my daughter shot this deer and we're now eating you know, parts of it and yeah, definitely. You, you, they That's just nice. feel better, you know. Yeah, 100%. So. Yeah, one of my mates, he actually, um, it, it's his mate. So my mate's mate has set up his garden shed as a smoke shed. And it, yeah, right. it, it's in Brisbane here and they can only do it in June. So pretty much in June every year, they'll get out there two to three weekends of the of the um, of June and just yep. smoke up a whole heap of salami. And so he just kind of hands me sticks for the rest of the year. It's so good. Every once in a while, he'll just come into the gym. He's like, hey, mate, got you another stick. And it's just venison that they've gone and collected. And they'll nice. often do like a, a two hinds of venison. Oh, sorry. Of, um, yep. Yeah, two hinds of, of salami. And it's just, it's to die for, dude. It's so yeah. good. Yeah, and it's... And it comes at, like, as we know, there's a big movement on eating clean and, and you know, paleo, blah, blah, blah. And uh, that whole journey of, of collecting your own food and then preparing it, smoking it, whatever, making it into salami, making it into pies, it's just a good vibe. Mm. You know, and it, it, it's a very good, not an argument, but it's a very good case to lead, you know, for, um, I don't know Stacey hardly at all, your better half. Mm. Yeah, that's what I say it. Yeah, yeah, but I'm sure, like when you when you had the conversation to her, like, hey, I want to study deer and all the rest of it. If you come from the angle of, you know, this is wholesome, you know, grass fed meat, and we could bring it home, and it's going to be awesome for us, and you know, the nutritional value and all the rest of it. It's kind of easier to get that over the line. Um, I had a hook, line, and sinker. That's for sure. <laughs> if she knew, yeah, yeah. if she knew the real story. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's just a, it's just how you've had that sandwich. You know, <laughs> how you get it across. Yeah. Um, same with a new bow. You're like, well, darling, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it um, and then yeah, that's what I was saying before. Like, and guys helping guys, whether it be. You know, hey, do this cut, or when you butcher it, do this way, or, mm. or you know, um, do the the chops this way, or even the lamb shanks. Like, oh, not the lamb shanks, but the shanks. Like, I'll take the shanks off the deer. I will not leave them in the bush because I'll bring them home and oh, I, I slow yeah. I slow cook them with lamb the shanks. Cuts, yeah, 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 and they 
they're just to die for. And mm. yeah, same with the heart. Like I always bring out the heart. That is actually my favorite cut. I actually just introduced, we, I went hunting with some guys recently um, and introduced them to the heart. And we did it just over the, over the fire pit while we were there. Yeah, yeah. And um, one of the guys, he, he just showed his gratitude for it. He's like, man, I love new experiences and you've just opened my whole life up to a whole new experience. Like something that I've been doing for my whole life is hunting and I've never eaten a heart. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not until you show, like, and it was shown to me by someone, a hunter, and I forget who it was. They they just said, just cut the heart out and then just peel it open mm. and cut all the ventricles out of it and then just slice it up and then put a bit of garlic butter on a hot pan, boom, yeah. boom, Salt either pepper. side. Yeah, mm. and it is, oh, to die for. You'll never leave another heart in the bush once yeah. someone, you know, you explain how to eat it. Yeah, 100%. Because it's a little, yeah, when you first cut it open, you're like, oh, that's a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and, are. yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's little stuff in there, but, yeah. <laughs> but what you, you, you know, like anything, you just prep it, go from there. Like, I haven't um ventured onto tongue yet, but I know guys will also yeah, take no, the tongue. I'm, I'm a tongue man, it's good, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I've not done that yet. Um, but uh, hey, there's always room for improvement, yeah. But, um, yeah you just gotta boil it for long enough to let it cook. Yeah. Well, it's like an hour, you just boil salt with some um bay leaf, like a like a silver side. Yeah, essentially. And then you pull it out and just chop the chop the actual tongue skin off. And then you just yes. chop into like, my favorite is to chop it into thin slices and then re fry it and just eat okay. it. It tastes like a it's like a fatty cut of meat. Like it tastes like I don't know. It, it's in, it's incredible. Yeah, well my I was talking to my mother about it over Christmas because she, you know, she's in her seventies. I shouldn't say that because she might listen. But <laughs> The uh, she they used to do tongue all the time, and yeah, she explained it. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cold. Yeah, I probably ate like millions of them when I was a kid, but you just don't know. <laughs> no, exactly. Um, and then the, she would she explain exactly what you said. Yeah, you just peel it off, and then I was like, oh, okay. So I'll probably do that this year as well. Uh, again, just using the whole whole animal, um, yeah. and it's yeah, it's just good good vibes, and especially like. To, to come full circle and talk about shooting stick bows and all that, like it, it's hard enough, you know, like bow hunting, mm-hmm. it's hard enough, you know, getting within range with a stick bow and then drawing and getting the shot and recovering and doing a good shot. And that whole that whole full circle journey of sitting back on, yep, and that was a pain in the ass to carry that out. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I aged four years from that day. <laughs> but, uh, Man, it was you know, worth it. Yeah, yep. handmade arrow, clean through. And that like the last year I shot with my stick bow was that clean pass through, stag fell over, boom, couldn't ask for it better. Like it was probably one of the best close range things I did in a while with with a stick bow, and it was just like ninja skill times ten. Yeah, and um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and it was just a good, yeah, you know, good hunt, uh, good ending to it, and then meet meet on the on the table, and it's yeah. That self whole self satisfaction, that self serving sort of gratitude is yeah rings rings true, and I, it's that's no argument to have with with the right people, you know. And as I think you and I were saying before, you're never going to change the far left and far right, like no, definitely not anti hunters and full on um, anti vegans and all the rest of it. But they'll never meet in between, um, a bit like political parties. Mm. So, but if you can come with an open, you know, explanation, I think. Um, What's the guy out of the states? Meat eater fella. Oh, Steve Ranella. Yeah, he's he's because he's well spoken, well yeah. read, and obviously a smart guy. He can articulate that. And there's a couple I've watched a I think it's a YouTube where someone one of his book yeah, signings pulls him on about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it, yeah, it's really good. And it, it's amazing his retort. And it wasn't he just spoke like a waltz. You know, he yeah. it wasn't it wasn't an argument. It was it was it. Dare I say it? He debated with this guy. And he said, I actually know more about the animal than you do. Mm. And he was right because he studied his whole life. And there's a lot of bow hunters out there and a lot of rifle hunters and that, that would be in exactly the same boat. Probably can't, yeah, probably can't articulate it as good as what Stephen did. But um, his, his, his way with words was, just, was phenomenal and his knowledge. Mm. And there's guys like whether they're down south hunting, hunting Samba or, or Reds here in Brisbane, up north chasing uh, – Rusa and, and Chittle, they're the same, you know, like guys like Brad Smith, Dan Smith, um, Bill Baker, Rod Resty Soul, like them guys learnt so much about pushing deer around. Yeah. And and you learn with, with being with them guys, you know, whether it be don't use that broadhead, use this broadhead. 
don't use that arrow, use this arrow. Don't shoot from here because you're too close. That stag will duck the arrow. But if you come back a bit, mm. you know, and you're at that 40 metre mark, he won't hear the bow. Yeah. Um, and I'll, Dan Smith, he's a big believer of that. Um, talking chittle. Yeah, okay. Hmm. He said, if you're at 20 metres, that, that you arrow won't get there, that chittle will dodge it. Yeah. But if you're, if you're between 40 and 50, it's and obviously delay. you can shoot and have yeah, your yeah. capability, you know, with a compound. Um, the stag, he'll either be totally gone or he'll be still there, not hurt it. Mm. And that, that's, and I'm, I hope I'm not, I haven't made a, a mess of that, Dan, if you're listening, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that's how he, he explains it. And I mean, he's hunted and, and guided and still guides on Chittle up, up north. And it's probably known as the, the one of the gurus now with Chittle deer, just because they're so hard to hunt, as mentioned before. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. And again, like saying, like I did before, Crawling up at the grass with them, it, it's just a hard thing, you know. And then, because mm. I'm an idiot and I shoot a stick bow, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> when you finally get one on the ground, and like I said, I was lucky enough to shoot three of them, get three of them on the ground, and not none, no, none of those were stags; they're all all does, yeah, uh, or hinds as they call them, chittle hinds, and uh, just a great feeling. And I've I still got uh, the rug in my workshop, yeah, and I'm, beautiful, I was, aren't they? yeah, beautiful, beautiful, you know, yeah, it. Um, Great meal, great great skin, and a, a great hunt. And I mean, that I I earned those, and then oh, some. 100%. And, and <laughs> yeah. the memories, right? Yeah, 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 hundred percent. You're exactly right. Mm. Um, so, mate, just give us like the quick two minute rundown on Pathfinder. Um, there, I'm I'll timing you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it all Pathfinder all kicked off in regards to, uh, and again, not to talk business or. Plug my business, but hey, you asked. It's um, exactly right. It, it all kicked off with the broadheads. Mm -hmm. uh, so tough head broadheads with a single bevel broadhead that I used in Africa uh, and here. They come on social media. I seen the guy who bought the new com bought the company out. I said, hey, if you want someone in Australia to to sell these beer, distribute, I'm your man because I love your broadheads. And we got talking, and I'd already had this idea of having Pathfinder. I had the name and the logo and all that. And I, and I thought, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll sell these broadheads. And then speaking with my wife because she's smarter than me, <laughs> she said, well, it's a lot of work for just broadheads. And so we kicked off a few other things. And then it sort of went onto a bit of a back burner because then Kafara Australia kicked off, uh, rolled with that for a number of months, and then I sold off my, uh, my shares in that company, my, my stake in that company, focused – turn back onto Pathfinder mm -hmm. and then that's we ran from there and it's just literally moved leaps and bounds now through oh I guess hard work um and it, how a lot of persistence right not only that but oh, I think there's there's a there's a big place today in business and I'm not a businessman by any stretch but I think there's a big place in no matter what you do whether you sell cars or houses or you know hunting gear like I do, um, it's just transparency and honesty. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes a long way. And I've always, and, and the gear, everything we sell, I've personally used or tested or both, uh, and I'll never sell crap. I'll yeah. never sell something that'll cost someone their life, wreck someone's hunt, uh, and I just won't do it. And, I, and I'm lucky enough or, or unlucky enough where I've spent most of my adult life with a pack on my back, um, whether it be hunt bow hunting and and or um, my time in infantry yeah just short of 10 years so when someone says to me you know hey al what about this pack you know and yes we obviously do sell kafara gear but I, you know there's plenty of other good packs out there that i can recommend you know do's it's and don'ts or whatever else as well right yeah yeah 100 percent. not everyone can afford a kafara pack and not everyone can afford um you know uh, crossfire pack or, or whatever it is. And I still got crossfire packs. And, and anyway, um, but what I'm trying to say is like quality of gear, you pay for what you get. Mm -hmm. And sure, we all start on the poverty. Most of us start on the on the poverty sort of cycle where we've got you know, just enough to get a set of binos and yeah. bows and boots and, because it's a big list, you yeah. know. If you go there, you're going to spend 50 grand. But, you know, and then you sort of got to weigh it up. Okay, well, I'm going to backpack hunt once a year. I don't need to spend a thousand dollars on a backpack I'm going to use once a year. But if someone wants to do it more, four or five times a year, I can guarantee that you know a Kafara pack or or whatever pack with a frame is going to fit you better with someone that gives you the right information. And I can honestly 
have a conversation with anyone about what you know how to pack a pack correctly where to put your weight you know where to put heavy things light things all that you know where it should sit on your hips and all the rest of it mind you i learned the hard way and and sort of the military way and it's not correctly not necessarily the right way in in carrying a pack because we you know you had to be your gear had to be deployable and usable in a military setting in a tactical setting yes, that that's not a little bit that's a little bit different to just walk up a hill you know with your crocs and your thongs tied to the back of your pack <laughs> um so but a lot of them same aspects and, and uh ideas and whatnot are very strong in me still but they they then overflow into how to correctly carry or correct carriage of equipment as we used to call it yeah. so you know straps properly done weight properly distributed amongst the pack you know don't have super heavy thing up in your head because the the force is going to like knock you around knock you around um those sorts of things so i can have a chat to anyone in that regard i'm not saying that to sell stuff i'm saying because i generally mean that like mm. if you have an issues with the pack just sing out i'll help you know same with bows or stick bows or whatever so that's pathfinder like we sell we can pretty much well we we do bring in uh, a good amount of kafaru gear um, we we are in, we are in a good position where we can bring in anything. If someone says to me, "Hey, Al, I want this pack with this frame and these pouches," I'll you know give you a quote, uh, and then you just go, "Yep, that's cool." Bam, we we ordered that bad boy. What we have caught been caught out in the past is guys have ghosted us, so they go, "Oh, I want this pack and this pack," and you order it in, and just radio silence, mm. and then you know we might be out of pocket. You know, twelve hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And for a small company just kicking yes. off, you know, and because their packs and their frames, not so much their bags, but their frames are sort of made to fit to a degree, like the height wise, weight, you know, belt size, all the rest of it, strap length. Um, you sort of got to find someone that's you know the same sort of size, yeah, and, and just not lucky we, yeah, well, and lucky we could uh, offload them to to someone else for the same price. So you know, but it has caught us in the past. But you know, we, we'll sell. We, and we've got, to, again, not to bang on about Kafara, but we've got a few things, irons in the fire with those guys in regards to new products that mm-hmm. they haven't even made yet and we've agreed to to make probably after they move. So, yeah, there'll be more. I can't really say too much now, but we've got a couple of things or three items that we've got to collaborate with with our brand and theirs. Yep. Um and then, you know, we've got our own knives that are getting made at the moment uh, in the US by a mate of mine. Again, we trialled and, and tested them here with the design that we come up with. Uh, we call them the Kestrel. So they'll be coming out in the next couple of months and they'll be on the website. So you'll basically go through and you'll order which handle material you like and, and yeah, sort of come as custom first made. served, yep. custom to a, to a degree. Yep. Um, we've got the Taito knives that are... You know, a replaceable blade knife. They're all made in the US as well. Uh, Warfighter Coffee, you know, we got a good collaboration with the guys at uh, Warfighter Coffee. Um, and they another veteran-owned business as well. So, mm-hmm. and it, like I said, everything we use, sell, is more, yeah, every, I personally use and endorse. And I won't sell crap. I won't sell shit. I won't rip anyone off. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll stand by. And if I make a, a wrong call and something doesn't work, I'll, you know, We'll fix it on our end because I look at our business like I'm a customer, and yeah, I'm, again, I'm I'm no businessman, but I know how sort of people want to be spoken to, treated, uh, and, and also that's the, half of it, right? The, the, the service, yeah. yeah, the service, yeah. And I mean, if if we've made and we've made mistakes, I've sent the wrong gear to wrong people and <laughs> wrong addresses and <laughs> mixed orders up, so I've packed them, put the wrong shipping label on, so one, <laughs> you know, guy A's got guy B's order, and vice yeah. versa. I'm like, yeah. oh, how am I gonna un? How am I going to fix that? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, but we're still learning. I mean, and the whole aim of Pathfinder was literally to pay for, you know, a hunting trip. That, yeah. And I said that was the goal. Like I said, I don't want to buy a new Land Cruiser or, you know, Ferrari or whatever. If this pays for my family to – if it pays for flights to Africa or back to Canada or wherever, then I'm, I'm ahead, you know. And, yeah, I, and if I'm selling good products to guys and if I'm, you know, delivering – good kit and, and if if that if that is the outcome then, then so be it I, i'm i'm not doing this because and we could close the shop tomorrow like my wife and i still work our day jobs mm-hmm. not that we are going to um the business is going great we we're really enjoying it and uh, you know 
a small business should be enjoyable because yeah, I, I work on it every day. So I'll, I'll come home from my day job and I'll do, you know, I'll fill orders, you know, work on the website, answer emails, that sort of thing. But I enjoy doing that. I'm not doing it, you know, because I want to rip someone off or, or, you know, I need another, like I said, another Land Cruiser, not that I got one. But um, <laughs> it's it's more of a, again, just offering good products. And it, we, we, we'll, we will slowly build on it on our product base and all the rest of it. Again, it, it obviously comes down to cash flow, but um, I'm not going to, again, stock shit. And we've been approached by a number of companies, I'm not going to say who they are, in regards to, hey, can you carry this or, or can you jump on board with us? I'm like, oh, no, I'd rather not. You know, it doesn't suit our, our business model or yeah. our or where we want to go. We, we can't see it in our, our business. We don't want to get the murky water, right? Yeah, and I think it's just, and that, again, being honest with people and, and telling them up front, hey, that, that doesn't suit us, I'm sorry, um, and, and go from there. And unfortunately, we just got the email today, actually, with uh, the Wild Deer Expo. So we're going to be down there at a booth, which was uh, it's officially been canned today. So oh, by the time you, yeah, your podcast will come out, no doubt everyone will know. But and I'm, they, have, they have said they're looking at postponing it, so okay. whether they're going to move it to later in the year. I'm not sure. Uh, and it's, again, due to COVID slash people getting their government. Story. Yeah. yeah, yeah, government. And um, I think everyone's sick of hearing about the word. Um, hmm. And that's disappointing because it was going to be a good springboard for us in regards to the business having it there and just meeting people. Yeah, you know, definitely, like, that network building. That I, yeah. yeah, and just gets people putting a face to a name. Like, I did said, the amount of orders we send out um, – I don't know everyone. No, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But, but when they when they talk to me through the emails or whatever, like, hey, how are you going? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> but I don't know who they are. No, 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 exactly. Yeah. But yeah. everyone talks like this and whatever else. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and it, and that's a good thing. Like people come up and shake my hand. I have got no idea who they are. And that's not being rude. It's just I just don't know them. No. Because, you know, they could be in Victoria and I could have, you know, they could have bought a, a good amount of stock off us, which is cool, but I've never would have met them. Yeah. Um it's a beautiful thing about it, right? Yeah, yeah, and, I, and we just sort of, and I'm pretty lucky, like my wife's pretty pretty cluey, so she set up all the website and loads all the products and that, and then I do, yeah, the social media side of things most times, uh, email marketing, that's, and I'll pack orders and stuff them up sometimes and, and whatnot. But, uh, and then the coffee as well, we, we load and, 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 and sell the, the coffee at a home here, so we buy that in 20-kilo lots, and that's all sort of a bit of family business, that as well, in, in loading them the bags up and powered by and, coffee yourselves, hey, to get it done. <laughs> yeah, well, my wife doesn't drink it, so oh, there you go. More yeah, it's all more more for me. That's that's I, I laugh <laughs> at that. <laughs> but uh, that's that's pathfinder, mate. And um, how good? Yeah, a little longer than two minutes, but I like it. It was good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, you did say we might have to do part two. So. No, I think we'll definitely have to do a part two, mate, because, um, yeah, it's getting late and I'm actually up early tomorrow anyway, so I do have to kick off anyway. Yeah, you're but like, think- uh, what's his name? Just quickly. Uh, you'd be like Jocko. I think I actually seen, that's the last time I seen Stacey. Was, did she line up for Jocko? You know what? We stood in line for ages and yep. we got like, I don't know, I think we got like 15... We were 15 meters from him or something like 10 meters from him and then I had a really important meeting that I had to go for yeah and so I ended up leaving and she had to catch an uber home like it was a it was a big ordeal and then she got up close enough to him and they're like oh sorry he's not taking any more but he's signed a whole heap of books so it will be uh, ready for you at the back and that was kind of the day so we went and lined up I think we paid like 70 bucks or something for the, the in, in town parking like in the city parking yeah 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 yeah. Brisbane, yeah. yeah, yeah I, that's what I'm, I remember seeing Stacy there I've probably seen you as well because I remember seeing I seen her I know that that's Stacy from well, anyway long, as you know yeah um, and then I, I remember seeing you there because you were talking and yeah. then now that you're now that you said yeah you had to leave and yeah she was yeah, back in line because the line was crazy like, it, was it was up ridiculous we were out we were out so it was a two or three story building we were down the bottom to start with and we were like looped around a few different bookshelves and then we came up the stairs and we were up the stairs and that's when I had to leave so yeah ah uh, yeah yeah, yeah that's, that's there you go so are you like in the the four o'clock club oh yeah yeah definitely it's um I don't know if it's a labor of love or what, but <laughs> I think being in the in the fitness industry, that's where it first started. But a lot of um, I do a lot of coaching calls with the states right now. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, and timeline, so timeline, just to make it happen. A lot of my days are starting at like uh, 
quad, quad to four, something like that. So, yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah. I do it because it's going to get me further. It's hey, the that's best part to it, right? And you only get out of the life what you put into exactly. it, mate. So, and obviously, you guys work hard. And from what I've seen on social media, you just uh, yeah, you've got a good a lot of good things happening. So, yeah, thanks, mate. But, no, I uh, appreciate it. We'll uh, we'll have to uh, end this, and we Indeed. can definitely so let's, do a part uh, two. Let's chat about. So, where can people find you? So, www.pathfinderoutdoors.com.au. That's on, correct. Uh, on Instagram, it's pathfinder underscore outdoors underscore. Yep. And then, yep. what's your personal one? The real Ad- Al Kidna, is it? The real Al Kidna. Yeah. So that's a private account for a number of reasons, um, mainly because I had some photos stolen. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, and I, I mean, I, I always view people or well, vet people, I should say, that if they send me a friend request, whatever they call it, mm-hmm. um, or follow, it doesn't worry me. I've just, I've had photos and things stolen. I'm not like a, I'm not like the world's best photographer, but it just annoyed me. So yeah. when I started Pathfinder, I kept that account open yes, and then I just privatised my personal account. But, yeah, we're all on Instagram and social media. Um, for sure, sing out, say good day, say hello. Uh, send any questions in regards to, you know, shooting a stick bow, carrying a pack. Um, I'm happy to help anyone, whether it be tuning arrows, broadheads, and you don't have to use our stuff. I just, I'm happy just to help anyone because it, it'll come full circle. I'll know, 100%. you know. I need help with salami, so someone's going to help me with that. So. <laughs> Hopefully off of this, mate. Hopefully off of this. Yeah. Well, thank you yeah, again for a... your time, mate. Really appreciate it. Not a worry at all. Thank you. That wraps up this week's episode. Thank you so much for joining us, team. If you did have any topics, questions, or you wanted to suggest a guest for Becoming a Bowhunter, you can send me an email at matty at becomingabowhunter.com. If you are enjoying the show or you've enjoyed in particular episodes, please do me a solid and share it around with your friends. If you are not already, please hit the subscribe button as the more subscribers we get, the higher the podcast gets ranked and that definitely helps out for sure showing it to other individuals. If you are not already following me on Instagram, it's at becomingabowhunter.podcast and on YouTube, it's becomingabowhunter. Get out team, fling some arrows, get that practice in and walk those yards in the paddocks until you find those critters. That is it for now, but not the last time that you'll hear from Becoming a Bowhunter. Hunter.